Sarah Hellerman and I'm a senior director with Battelle for Kids. I am so excited to be here today with an awesome team from Strongsville. They are a member of a SOAR network in Battelle for Kids. And we're here to learn about their portrait to practice journey, to learn more about how they brought their portrait to practice in their system. And what I'd like to do to get started is to invite Jenny to tell us a little bit about Strongsville and to also introduce your team. Thank you, Sarah, I appreciate that. And thank you for having us um, and having us here to talk a, about our journey. Um, we're really excited about it and passionate about it. So it's exciting to be able to share it with, with everybody. Um, like you said, this is Strongsville City Schools. I'm the assistant superintendent for the district. So I, I oversee our work with our portrait. We call it our model Mustang. Um, our district, we have about 5,600 students. We're suburban districts in Northeast Ohio. I think we've been working on this work for the last four years. I think we've been a part of SOAR for about four years now, if I counted right. Uh, and it's just, it's exciting because we're finally at the point now with everything that we are learning through our, our meetings and our, our journey, we're starting to put into practice. Um, and so, and it's, it's, it's starting to become from a poster on a wall to more of, you know, things that are happening inside the classroom. Um, I think, you know, where we are now is that, I'll start with the positive right now, where we are now is that we have a group of strong teacher leaders that have been through a year of really um, targeted learning in terms of what, what our competencies really truly mean and how they can be implemented and integrated into the classroom with uh, their content. So I think they've done it, they've practiced it, they've given us feedback as to what works and what doesn't work. And even to the point of how to scale this, you know, in a bigger way with our entire district. Uh, so right now where we are is we have great pockets of people that are doing wonderful things and even beyond, you know, what we even did in the district learning team. And, and what I mean by that is we have project-based learning groups, we have teachers that are trying bigger projects and really trying to bring that authentic learning piece and that deeper learning piece into their classrooms. Um, but when we look at trying to scale it with everybody and, and ensuring that we have that equitable experience for all kids, no matter what building they're in, what teacher they have, that's where we're trying to go. Uh, so in terms of where we were, we, we had our competencies established, we had some graphics, we had you know some ideas, and like I said, some teachers trying some different things. Um, and, and so this year, really, we've, we've, we've moved light years ahead. We've gotten, we've revisited our competencies. We've revisited even the, the small statements underneath them uh, and, and made sure they really made sense. We reordered it. So our portrait of the graduate, we really kind of have version two now, uh, which I think is in a much better spot to make more sense. We have different resources that we've used through what we've learned through SOAR, like Chalk Talk and Praise Question Suggest is more familiar now with, with the, this group. Uh, and using that in, in conjunction with already the strategies that our teachers are using in the room is encouraging that collaboration and that communication and that deeper thinking of our students. Um, and so, you know, I think now we actually kind of can see the pathway in. You know, some of these skills may be taught daily. Some of them may be in a unit. Some of them may be all the way into a, a PBL, um, you know, project or whatever. So it's it's really exciting to see how it's taken. It's moving from that poster. It's moving from ideas and thoughts into really classroom integration. And so, you know, I think where we are now is we are really in a good spot to then carry this work long term and, and, and to a bigger scale um, into our professional development learning for this upcoming year. So I, I'm really excited about it. I think it's, it's you know, had, had such a great impact. And, and Sarah, I'll just say one more thing. This idea came from a book that I read called The Design Thinking Entrepreneurial Visionary. I call it the devil book um, for leaders because it really, they talked about creating a pilot group that really understands and can not only try things, but give feedback to you along the way so that when you do go to scale it, you're doing the right thing. You're putting your efforts and your energy in the right spot to get that, to, to get impact really, to make the work that we're doing impactful and meaningful, not only to our students, but to the, to the educators that are involved with it. Because I think we all know as leaders, once teachers find meaning in it, and once they feel that it's working and it's making a difference for their students, 
they're going to keep going with or without me. They're going to keep going with it because it, it's what matters. And I think overall, the issue that we're having is, and I think schools are having across you know, the nation right now from the pandemic. We can say it's from the pandemic. We can say it's from social media. We can say it's kids are different right now. But really, we're seeing that kids are lacking skills. Uh, and so in order to kind of problem solve, we hear it all the time. The kids aren't engaged. The kids don't want to do the work I have. The kids aren't collaborating. They don't know how. And so when we, when we looked at it from that angle to say, what problem do I want to solve in my classroom? You know, my kids aren't, I give them directions and they don't follow them. Okay, great. That's a great problem. Let's try to not only teach them the content, but how do we kind of integrate that teaching of a skill that's very important uh, with what I'm doing. And so to provide those opportunities, um, I think has been very successful for the teachers that are going to talk soon and, and share their stories with you. But, um, you know, that's kind of where we were and, and what we're trying to get to. Thank you so much, Jenny. What additional steps have you taken to align your system to your portrait? So I know I talked about, you know, our, our this team that we've created and we called it, we, we transformed from a district leadership team that's a traditional leadership team that, you know, works with the TVTs are working and then it goes to the BLT and then it comes up to the DLT to a district learning team. So brought, bringing together, you know, various teachers from various levels. We had preschool all the way up into to high school represented different content areas. You know, as my team shared, we have an elementary, we have ELA, we had science, we had math. Uh, we also had some of our, our coaches in our district on the team as well, uh, because they work with a variety of teachers and people. So getting their feedback was, was important. And so through this district learning team, we spent the entire year looking at all our competencies, understanding what, what we developed I can statements um, for each one. Uh, each competency, each of our, our clarifiers. And so we have, you know, very specific. So they studied those. Um, we also brought in some guest speakers, so former students that came and talked to them about, here's what we need from our teachers. Here's what we need and what we're experiencing in the real world. And here are some things that it would have been better if our teachers had done these things for us. Um, and, and I think that was a very powerful experience for our team and just them being together. So we spent probably, I think maybe four days, maybe three and a half days together um, and just collaborating, listening and a lot of work time. So a lot of revisions of planning and helping them kind of really go through what SOAR has shared through the design process. You know, I'm going to design something, I'm going to try it, I'm going to reflect back on it and I'm going to try it again and see what worked. And so, you know, spending a ton of time on that and allowing them to work together and, I, and they'll talk about it here. But what I thought was powerful and unintended outcome that I didn't foresee is that they said, gosh, I love as a preschool teacher, I love talking to the high school science teacher about what she's doing because I can use some of the things she's doing um, in my classroom. So it just goes to show that these competencies and these skills that we want to build in our students um, to take with them in, in whatever they do are universal. You know, whether you're a preschooler or you're a 12th grader, these are still things that just never end. You know, how I communicate can be different when I'm preparing to talk to maybe a group of teachers versus maybe how I communicate, you know, with a couple administrators on the side. And so when I have to build that skill, sometimes it takes different things that I need. And, and what we've thought about is that these skill, the skill learning never ends. It's just, you know, different situations, different people, you know, and we can continue to build and, and, and go back to the drawing board and build those skills. So, you know, I think overall it's been a great process and I, I you know, I just want you to hear what they have to say. And um, because I think, you know, hearing it from them and, and what they experienced is, was, it, it, it brought me so much joy to hear what they learned from the process. Awesome. Thank you. So, it sounds like it's been an absolutely amazing year and a big year of learning for your district. What um, mm -hmm. solutions or strategies are you considering now as you wrap up the year? What What is on your mind? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the educators out there will, especially the administrators will appreciate this as, as you end one year, you're, you're simultaneously planning already for the next year. So it's like double duty at the end of the year. Um, and, and so what we've already thought about, we've done a ton of work. Our curriculum department has done a ton of work leading 
um, how to understand content standards, developing assessments, you know, from formatives to summatives, you know, new programs of math, how are we going to teach writing and, you know, just a ton of work there. So we feel we're in a really good spot, really strong in that area. And so now it is time to kind of say, how do we tie these skills in at the same time with the work we're already currently doing? So it doesn't feel you know, like another thing or something else. And so these teachers that you're going to hear from here have done that and they've done it, you know, I'll say it was easy. They make it sound easy. Let's say that. I know it's it's challenging, but, you know, so looking forward into next year and how we can design professional development for our teachers and everybody else, like I spoke earlier about making this more systematic, how can we bring what the district learning team learned this year and gosh, if I could get our entire district to the point they are now, we would be light years ahead of where we ever thought we could be. So trying to design that professional learning um, for everybody, and they're going to be a huge part of that process. Um, and just to make sure that the experiences for our students are equitable are, are kind of our next steps. Thank you so much. I feel like every time I talk to your team, I get a sense of coherence. I know that you think so critically and so deeply about every move that you make, uh, and it just really comes through. I also feel like you've been really patient in this process. I mean, you said you did a lot this year, but you also have been very strategic. So well, I look forward to hearing from um, the team on the call. And so basically our question is what happened, you know, from your perspective, um, what aha uh -huh moments did you have? Um, if there are any lesson, lessons learned that you would want to share, we're certainly open, open to that. But really, we would love to hear your story. Jenny, I didn't know if you wanted to invite anyone in particular to, to start. Yeah, I mean, we'll, maybe we'll start with our, our young learners. We'll start with Emily and have her share her process and, and her experience. Sure. So at the elementary level, when I think about my second graders that are seven and eight years old and 10 years from now, when they graduate, the jobs that they're going to go into might not have even been created yet. So to think about giving them skills that will transcend like any content that they might know or that they can go fetch on the Internet, um, but really like the skills that they're going to need to be successful in these jobs that we don't even know, quite honestly, what they might be. Um, so that really kind of struck me when we had our first meeting and thinking about, you know, how can we build them to be collaborative and resilient, empowered, innovative, like those are the important skills that they need to leave. If at the second grade level, then high school, you know, they'll be, they'll be okay when they get to college or, you know, the workforce. Um, so I thought it was really important to like purposefully integrate those skills into any lessons that I was creating. Um, I also was doing a book study with, um, our gifted coordinator on PBLs and just seeing how that work ties in different content areas and how powerful they can be when you tie social studies and math and ELA. Um, and they're simultaneously, you know, building skills in all of those areas. Um, and then one of the students, after we had done one of the lessons, came up to me and she's like, thank you so much for letting us do that. And I thought, well, no problem, right? Like, <laughs> no, I, I love that you're saying thank you, but also that you think that that was something that was, you know, extra or something that maybe they didn't have to do. Um, so that was really neat. And it made me think like I really need to be more diligent about creating these lessons more frequently and, you know, tying in different content areas to get, you know, that deeper learning. Um, and then just also like our makerspace and all the materials that we have in makerspace, how awesome they are to lend themselves to, you know, collaborative work and being innovative um, and empowered. And, you know, I feel like Jenny always says voice and choice and giving them that opportunity to really express themselves and show what they know for that standard. Um, but in a different way, maybe they're not all doing the same presentation. They're not all writing the same project, um, the makerspace has been huge to kind of give them that, you know, extra piece um, that they don't always get to use. Um, so that at the elementary level, I thought was so valuable. Thanks so, Emily. so much. Holly, you want to go to Holly now? She's middle school. 
Yeah, so I'll talk from the middle school perspective. So I feel that as a district, we have a very strong understanding of universal design for learning, but it was how can we take that and then really put our focus on the skills. And I feel from day one to the end of the year, I've been learning with my students as we've gone along. Um, you know, it all started about just having conversations, like what does it look like to be, you know, empowered or collaborate and just kind of having a conversation what that looks like in their day to day lives. And then when the students are, you know, doing things we do every day, think, pair, share, uh, group work, explicitly pointing out great job collaborating today. You know, you listen and you, you shared your point of view and collaborated well together. So just kind of making those connections in the moment. So then the students can go and reflect on that and kind of what that looks like, you know, in their future. Um, what has been big for me is just the reflection piece for students. Every Friday, we did a reflection journal where they kind of said, you know, whether it's in their daily life or in school, what competency did they feel they really mastered this this week. And it's through those conversations that I get to, I got to understand if the students were really understanding these skills. You know, if they were saying I collaborated this week, but they weren't exactly, they give me an example that they were collaborating, then I can kind of see the discrepancies. But just reflecting has been really powerful. Um, as well as just bringing a better understanding of what project-based learning is to light this year, I think has been huge. I think the district has done a great job preparing teachers and now it's just, you know, go and try it. And, and that's what we did. And it's through, you know, project-based learning where you can see students that have never spoke all year light up. Um, you know, they're, they're using the skills, you know, maybe they're editing videos or 3D printing something, you know, learning what is a business card all these different um, elements that came to light this year through putting an emphasis on the skills with the content, I felt was really what the big game changer was for this year. Thank you. And Heather, our science teacher at the high school. I, I feel like the district has done a really great job and especially at the high school um, with Focusing on curriculum, you know, and standards and, and, and making sure that the students are doing well at those things and, and meeting competencies within the standards. But if you talk to any high school teacher, which, which I have talked to them, nobody is really saying that the content is problematic. You know, the students are learning it, but they're lacking those basic skills. You know, I said in, in my science classes that um, the idea that these students have um, at the beginning of the year was that when we do work on a group project, we work on a group lab report, they were literally taking the divide and conquer. You know, you do one through two and I'll do three and four and, you know, and they weren't actually collaborating and working together. So um, I think these model Mustang competencies are really important because that's that's where the students are struggling with. They're struggling with these life skills. And at the end of the day, you know, when they graduate, you know, nobody's going to ask them, tell me about Newton's three laws and how they're applicable in your life, but they're going to need to know how to collaborate with one another and really collaborate, not just, you know, break it apart into a puzzle piece. And so that was one of like the competencies that I worked on was collaboration. Um, and then I also worked on um, empowerment with the students and having more voice and choice through that UDL kind of process. Um, and it was it was I'm going to be honest, it was it was a struggle at the beginning of the year, you know, introducing these things and having the students kind of get on board with the ideas. And they they wanted to revert back, you know, to doing the things that they initially were doing. You know, I, I introduced the idea of collaborating and, and how to do it. And the first time I did it, it was it was disastrous. It, it didn't go well. You know, they were trying to still piecemeal together things. And so I had to add in some scaffolds and we had to talk about, you know, you know, when you give your feedback to, you know, group member, you should start saying these things, you know, here's some choices that you could start off with, um, which really helped. And by the end of the year, you know, we were designing for my AP classes, we were doing a, a huge review. Um, and I allowed them instead of, you know, doing what I did last year, which was, hey, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, you know, and letting them pick a couple things. I said, you're going to come up with your own goals, you know, and you're going to show me how you've met those goals. Um, and it was great because they got to pick, you know, an academic goal. They got to pick a behavioral goal. So I had students literally listing goals, you know, to, to help them prepare themselves with the AP exam. You know, they would do stuff like, 
I'm going to promise to put my, I'm going to commit to putting my phone in the caddy so I'm not distracted by it. Um, other students were, I'm going to commit to getting eight hours of sleep at night. I had students telling me they were going to do daily yoga. And you wouldn't think, like I said, as an AP teacher trying to get ready for AP exams, that those things were important. But students were coming back to me and reporting how other teachers were telling them that they were more awake in class and they were more engaged during class just simply by doing, you know, those little those little things. So I really believe that at the end of the day, you know, teachers were not our problems aren't with content. We've got that down, especially in Strongsville, you know, and how to assess whether or not they're getting that content. And again, I've said this repeatedly, my master's is in curriculum instruction. I am a I am a curriculum gal, you know, to the bone, you know, that's what I, that's what I focus on. But the truth is at the end of the day, again, it's not, it's not the standards that they need to know. It's the skill set that is really important. And these model Mustang competencies allow us to kind of incorporate that into the curriculum in, in an authentic way for our students, which I thought was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. And I, I just have to interject for one second, Sarah, that, you know, I want to be clear through this district learning team. I never said, don't forget to include scaffolding. Don't forget to have your kids set goals. Don't forget. I didn't give, you know, a, a lot of direction. We gave a, a, a little guidance and questions really for teachers to reflect on and think, have you thought about this for your lesson? Have you thought about that? We reviewed, as Holly talked about our UDL framework, our learning framework that we follow, we reviewed that with this group and said, don't forget about this. Voice and choice are a huge component of empowering students, you know, to, to kind of create their own pathway to learn something. And so what they're, and Emily with the makerspace and what she shared, you know, I didn't say don't forget to use makerspace, but, you know, I think sometimes we underest as leaders we underestimate the power that our teachers have to connect these things and to be able to kind of say, OK, you want us to embed competencies. We still have to teach content, you know, letting them go. And, and these, you know, these are phenomenal examples that they're sharing of them working not only with themselves, but taking things back to their TBTs, their teacher based teams and kind of problem solving together and saying, what do our students need and where what do we know already and how can we build on that to really integrate skills? So. You know, I, I couldn't be more proud of the work that they've done and the risks that they, like Heather shared, sometimes it doesn't go well the first time, but it's key to be resilient ourselves as adults and, and try again um, and, and ask those questions and get more, more coaching and feedback ourselves as adults with each other. Um, and that was the power of this team. So I also want to share, turn it over to Bill because he has a little different perspective. He's a leader within the building, mm -hmm. you know, seeing firsthand what teachers are doing day to day and thinking about as Bill leads his building leadership team, how can I start to take what I'm learning through this group and slowly integrate it into a high school setting, which is always a challenge because you have, you know, a lot more disciplines, a lot more people and to try to create something more systematic within within the, our high school. So Bill, I'll let you kind of share your perspective. Yeah, it's it's you know, it's I, when we first start I'm listening to the teachers and it's uh it's so interesting to hear the different perspectives of the different grade levels. But one of the things that this year has taught really taught me and one of the things I think I'm the most proud of is at the start of the year we always talk about learning being student centered. We talk about students guiding the learning. And a lot of teachers want to be engaging, but engaging doesn't always mean learning and rigorous. So like when we do projects where we're building cars that roll down this, the hallway, and those are really cool things, but they're not always meeting the needs of the student in terms of the student having the skills. So one of the, one of the really cool things, I, I've talked to Jenny about this, I use the word pockets of innovation. Um, we have several pockets, what I call pockets of innovation at the high school. And what's really, really cool is that at the same time that we're encouraging teachers to, to do something that empowers students, they're also, because of the district movement, they're also incorporating ways that students are still using standard-based learning and they're still covering content. And I think about like, I think about math, for example, math is a very challenging area to be engaging. Um, I joke that if you walk through most high schools, math instruction has not changed since 1950. <laughs> they write, they watch, rinse and repeat. And one of the things I'm super proud of at the high school is a bunch of teachers came to me last summer and said, we want to do this new math. It's called Mathematic 
we wanted to be student centered, but it's super rigorous. And I said, okay, I went down to this training. Let's do it. And I want to echo what Heather said in August, when we went into the classrooms, I literally heard students. So students start in these groups and they get assignments to go out and they have to work on math problems that they have not been taught the content yet. So they're using pre-existing math skills to try to deduce something that's foreign to them. And I remember in the beginning, Alyssa Hostler's class and Michelle Kubais' class, kids would go, could you please just tell me the answer? <laughs> I don't want to deduce this. And as the year went on, what happened was, and, it, and Heather and Science is a good example, these pockets of innovation have kind of spread. Um, they've spread throughout the building. And the group work is an example where teachers love group work, but if but if you look at a lot of group work, one kid, the really, really, really smartest kid in the group does all the work. Well, the way we're doing group work at Strongsville, when you look at these model Mustang principles, the kids can't do that. Um, they're working in these groups and I'm watching teachers that don't sit down for 48 minutes um, and these pockets of innovation. And, and, and I, I hate to be the nerd data guy in the room, but I, as a principal, I can't help it. And when you look at like our math test scores, the teachers that did this method were 94% proficient, 67% of kids were accelerated or advanced. So for years you've heard, we can't do this work. We got to get through all this content or we're not going to make it. And the reality is when the kids are the drivers of the learning and they're figuring out their own misconceptions. And as a principal, I, I'm going to echo what Jenny said earlier. Like, I love seeing this, but then I want to like, how do I stretch this to everyone else and have everyone else do it? Um, so for me, the movement that Jenny's had with this DLT, along with what we're doing at the high school, they are parallel movements that are that are now at the end of the year. I think Jenny and I kind of get excited. They're starting to blend together. Um, and this movement starting to spread across. We're a large high school. We have 140 teachers. So change takes time. But we're seeing that this is starting to bleed into the other departments and it's starting to make palpable change in the building. Wow, this is awesome. It's just fantastic. Fantastic to listen to, um, just on all levels. I love hearing from educators at different uh, tiers within your system. Hearing the leaders' perspective, um, it's it's just fantastic. Um, so, Bill, you mentioned 140 teachers, and you know this idea of scaling. Um, it's I just want to recognize that it's really challenging, and I want to segue into a question that kind of hits on that because it's about capacity. And Jenny, I know you've already talked a bit about, I mean, it's so clear that you're empowering people and your system to think and to make decisions and to identify their own problems that need to be solved. But how have you deepened your system's capacity to support educators in developing these practices? Um, in, in terms of, you know, deepening, deepening the system itself, I think it does take a lot of that foundational work. You know, I think the teachers all talked about what standards work they've done. That took a few years, you know, to kind of really understand our standards. You know, then we get into our assessments, our assessments making a difference, you know, and, and what are we assessing and what do these assessments even mean? And, and then what do we do with the information we get from the assessments? Because that's key. You know, if we're if we're giving formative assessments, and, and we're seeing that some some kids get it, some kids don't, some kids are kind of in the middle. You know, I, I hear sometimes still, and this is where we need to continue to build that, oh, well, I guess I'll have to review tomorrow. All my kids didn't get it. And I my question back is all kids need to review tomorrow. And so, you know, I think when we look at combining skills with content, we really have to think about what are we doing on a daily basis that I can kind of start to build you know, build the skills that my students need to be able to com complete a PBL. You know, I mean, if you just give them, OK, we're going to do this PBL like you heard from them. There are students still that are saying, wait, I don't want to do it this way. I just want the worksheet. I just want what I'm used to. And that's the system we've created. Right. You know, there are some students that can just come to school and kind of skate through. And I always question, what are they really taking away and what are they remembering after the test? Because if we really talk about deeper learning, it's remembering not only the content, but the skills and the experience that I had that I can be able to, to trans, you know, transfer those skills and that content to anything that I want to do in the future. So in terms of continuing that deeper, that deeper learning, I'll turn it over to, to some of my teachers if they want to kind of speak to this. 
because as, and as Bill said, it's about building the capacity of everybody and continuing this momentum. And I think when teachers see that something's working, then they'll say, oh yeah, let's do that. So, you know, I'll just turn it over if anybody wants to kind of add a little bit more to what you tried or what you did to continue to, to deepen this, this learning, I'd be excited to hear from you. I could, I could pick it up from there. Um, I would say definitely that I think the notion is that, like Jenny said, that the district has supported us, you know, our this beginning DLT committee with with everything. And what they've allowed us to do, you know, as Jenny said, is they've allowed us to to fail, you know, and, and figure stuff out. You know, like I said, the first time I introduced stuff um, about being empowered and, and, you know, and collaborative and working together, it, it failed miserably. You know, like I said, but they have allowed us through our own process for us, you know, to, to figure things out. You know, and I immediately was like, I need to scaffold this and I need to add some support to help them do this stuff. Um, I think the idea is that I, I have this saying that says if nothing changes, if nothing changes. So if you don't start doing something different, you're going to get the same results that you've, you've always gotten. And so what these model Mustang competencies have done for us as far as, you know, 20th century, you know, learners is that I feel like I'm not just instilling values in my students anymore. I feel like I'm inspiring them so that they want to go out and they want to do things and they want to tackle problems on their own. You know, I definitely feel more like that. You know, there's a, a expression in, in education about that, um, the sage on the stage versus the guide on the side. You know, I feel like more that I'm the guide now, you know, and that's what they need because, you know, when I'm not there, you know, when they graduate, I can't hold their hand and help them with anything. And what we're doing in this district is we're allowing students to find their own path and we're helping them along that pathway. And, and the model Mustang competencies embedded with that content is, is definitely the, the pathway to follow. And sort of to piggyback, like DLT was that safe space, you know, like we want our classrooms to be that safe sp space where kids can feel like they can make mistakes and they can rebound and try again. Um, and I felt like DLT gave teachers that opportunity, like here's a safe space. I want you to try something new. And if it doesn't work, like when we come back together, I, you know, I can talk to Heather and Holly and Allison and say like, hey, what do you think about this for next time? Or, you know, listen to what they did and kind of like grab some of those ideas for next time. Um, but it was a very encouraging environment, safe space where I felt like if it didn't work the first time, we're going to go back and we're going to try it again. Um, and sometimes you learn the most when things don't go right. You know, like Heather said with scaffolding and saying like, okay, I need to do better. That's where the learning is. And that's where I feel like we want our students to do that. And so as educators, for us to be able to do that in DLT is also super powerful. Yeah, it's, it's yes. definitely that reflection piece. You know, we were reflecting, you know, and the students see us reflecting, you know, and they learn too that, again, you learn more from your mistakes than you do from the things that you get correct. You know, so they just like, like, Bill was talking about they, you know, at the beginning of the year, my students just want the answer. What's the, give me the answer. Did I do this correct? You know, and instead now they're inspired to kind of find their own pathway, you know, and, and, and come up with their own goals. And again, it's still, it's still content driven. You know, there's still things that they need to learn and, and we're driving that as teachers, but as far as how they're going about doing it, you know, it's a, it's a completely different atmosphere you know, in our classrooms and being able to collaborate with the other teachers and come up with ideas. I know I talked to a couple of teachers at the high school and, you know, we came up with this project kind of for the end of the year. And and once we were done, she really inspired me to change how I was doing stuff. So it's definitely a, a collaborative process and a kind of a learn and grow for us, you know, as, as well as the students. And I want to refer back to what Jenny said, is that our, our greatest testament of sharing this work is our students. So when they walk away, you know, excited and engaged all the way to the last day of school because of this, I think that's where the true power is. And I, I'll just thank you. I, I think that what they shared was was amazing. I, I think that overall, as leaders, you know, teachers, teachers learn by doing. You know, that, that's typical. You know, once they see it, they can feel it, they see how it goes, then they feel more comfortable to try different things. And I think through this process, like I think a couple of them shared, you know, it was a little bit of trial and error and, you know, because they also want to want to do the right thing. You know, they don't want to mess up. They, they want, to, you know, you only get a few chances with your kids each and every day and, and you want to make sure that you, you make the most of that time. 
But, you know, what we're trying to do is take traditional teaching practices that typically worked for students, you know, and, and have worked. And we have great kids in Strongsville. Don't get me. We have great kids. They come to us, supportive families overall. But what we're seeing, and I think, you know, leaders are seeing this across the nation, is that kids are not coming with the same skills that maybe we've seen in years past, you know, and, and the world is changing and evolving. And we need to change. You know, we only have control over what we do as leaders, as educators, and we need to evolve. We can't say, sit here and say, well, wow, I, you know, I used to do this and it worked all the time. It's these kids. It's not the kids. It's, it's the environment. And like, I think somebody shared, we're preparing them for jobs that, you know, we don't even know that exist. And so instead of preparing them for a specific trade or, or, or job, we need to prepare them with the skills that they need to do anything. And part of that is being passionate, being motivated, being intrinsically motivated and excited about what they're doing. And if they can leave our walls each day feeling, wow, I had a good day. It was interesting. It was fun. I learned some things along the way and I can't wait to come back and try some more. And you know, I know this is, is a podcast and we have at the high school, um, Bill didn't mention, this is another bright spot at our high school. And one of our members of our district learning team um, had her students do podcasting and they had to do all the work. They had to research. They had, and I went and visited them and they were so nervous to talk, you know, I, oh my gosh, what am I going to say? What if this doesn't go well? And as they got going, did they make mistakes? Yes. But they couldn't wait to go back again and share their knowledge and share what they had to do. And, and it's just it's so exciting to see this evolving and, and education evolving. Um, I know it's a big task, but I think the typical thing is we're worried about test scores. We're worried about what's that going to look like on paper. And so, you know, in the book that I read, this resonated with me so much, you know, we can measure test scores. We can measure that. It's easy to do. So we stick to that as educators. It's much harder to measure the impact of these building skills. And so that's why it's taken districts so long to really take hold of this and try to implement it because it's not always visible what you see. But hopefully from the stories that they're sharing, you can see that anecdotally it is visible and it is working. Absolutely. And Bill shared an example of some data, you know, that he collected in his system in the math class. So I know you, I, I know you have some of that. Absolutely. Um, your story is fantastic. And I, I commend you all. What I'd like to do to wrap up, we've, we've talked a lot about this amazing year. And I know that there are many, many, many steps that led up to the amazing things that happened this year. I feel like it was a year to create even greater coherence. It's fascinating for me to hear, and I know this about you, that you're this far into the journey and you were still working on really getting even more precise and better shared understanding about those competencies and what they really mean, you know, by developing those I, I can statements. All that careful work is going to help you so much. Um, so let's think about the future for a moment. What high priority action steps are you thinking about right now? I know Heather talked about paths. So let's think about the path you are setting up to set your district, um, you know, on a path for 21st century transformation moving forward. What are you thinking about? Well, I think, like I mentioned earlier, the thing on my mind is how do you scale this? You know, I, you know, I, we have this great group of teachers and, and some administrators that were on the district learning team and they were chosen specifically. You know, they were chosen because they already are trying to, to, to venture out of traditional practice and trying new things. And so I mentioned the podcast. You heard Emily with Makerspace. Holly's always been a leader with UDL and Heather was on my grading team years ago. We were trying to break down this whole philosophy of grading practices and how antiquated they are. And so, you know, selecting educators that already are of the mindset that I want to do better, I want to try new things was key. I think moving forward, we know that there are educators, like I just mentioned, that are like, well, what about my test scores? What if I don't get through all my pacing, you know, my pacing guide and I'm off track and I don't have time to let students do this thinking because we got to get through the book or whatever it might be. I think that's the key, right, is to say that like they all mentioned it, the time that it takes 
to, you know, we're, we're going to setting goals of yoga. You know, I think as an AP teacher, there may be some out there that say, I don't have time for that. I, they've got to do well on the AP test. So, you know, I think that's kind of what we're, we're trying to think about. That's an action step to build that same excitement, that same, um, you know, feeling of need that we need to change. We need to evolve. And this is why it's important. Um, so that's a high priority for me and, and a way to start with, you know, whether you go back to the Simon Sinek, why, why we need to do this. I think we need to think about how we're going to build that why in all of our educators and not just our teachers, but our staff you know, as well, from from our bus drivers to our cafeteria to it's it's not just a teaching thing. We see students in all different situations. And, you know, whether it's a student in the cafeteria that's not following a direction, you know, how can we approach them to have them build that skill of you need to clean up, you need to, you know, behave in such a way. This is, you know, how we act here in Strongsville. And so it's not just about building that why for our, our educators, but also everybody that works here so that we can be speaking that same language, you know, with, with our students and that they're not confused, you know, that they actually know what it means to be collaborative, what it means to be resilient. Um, I think in one of our experiences through SOAR, that was key, you know, kids go on job interviews and are asked a question of, tell me about a time you were collaborative. And they, they, they kind of, I don't know. But when we're using this language, we have one of our DLT members that's, I think, a, a first grade teacher and her kids are, are awesome. They're like, I was really resilient today. I kept trying when it got hard, you know. So thinking about next steps, too, is as, a, as Emily is a second grade teacher, first grade, kindergarten, whatever, how do you take those I can statements and kind of develop them to, you know, make it sense for a younger learner? Well, you know, instead of me doing that and, and sharing here's what I want you to do, I mean, Emily already did it in her class, you know, where she adapted those statements to her kids. So, you know, I think giving teachers autonomy to do the work, prioritizing some, some non-negotiables and some parameters for everybody so that they understand is going to be very important, and then allowing them to have the resources and the tools. Here's some things you can try. I think, you know, Again, like I said, our, our teachers have those powers and those skills to work together in teams um, to be able to create some some really meaningful experiences for, for our students. So, you know, to me, that's the next steps. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Bill because I want him to talk a little bit about the professional development he's already started with his, his teachers through his BLT process, um, because I think that is also key. How we model these things for our adults is going to even, you know, carry it further um, for them to apply it with students. And I think they mentioned that. And Bill has, has kind of taken some things and done that with his team. Yeah, I think this this whole kind of just talking about next steps and linking this back to the BLT is, you know, I think com where we've come from is that you can't create a culture of innovation with a, if you have a culture of fear. You have to be afraid, as everyone said before, unafraid to fail. And what the other and the piece of that that really I think about when I think about our, our building leadership team at the high school is nothing in your life that you've ever done have you walked out of bed and been amazing at. And for some reason, teachers are often afraid to try things because there's this huge pressure that it has to be, I have to hit the ground running and I got to be amazing at it. And what happens is that creates a sense of fail failure in terms of fear on failure of trying. So what's happened at the high school is we, we, this year was oftentimes it was not totally organized, but we had a lot of teachers who were trying different things that they were vetting through our building leadership team. And what that grew out of by about November was Heather, for example, did, um, Heather led Heather and two other math teachers led PDs in, um, ended up in our winter PDs on um, how to do flexible grouping. Other teachers did PBL PDs. We had teachers led PD in our building. There came a point where Heather said to me, Bill, I appreciate you, but I don't want you to be a part of this anymore. They're going to listen to me more than you. Me being a smart person, I think I'm smart. I recognize that Heather's right. Teachers leading teachers. When teachers feel empowered and the people like Heather and Alyssa and the people I mentioned earlier, when they are the ones leading the PD, I don't, again, this is not an insult to myself, sitting during in the PD myself, their teachers are more engaged, 
they're more they're paying attention better they're more willing to go back to their classroom and try something that they didn't normally try and i'll just kind of wrap it up by saying and i'm not just talking about teachers who are high flyers like jenny and i have a specific teacher that that is a, a teacher with a lot of experience and is in a math team that doesn't particularly like change um, I've spent two years and in, in coaching with Jenny where she coaches me and we have these conversations and we work together. And in a, T, in a TBT that we were both at, the teachers said, you know what? I really like this last PD. I'm going to try something. And I, I have to tell you, and you know, Heather, the Heathers of the world are amazing. They change buildings. But having this one teacher who will only focus on themselves, say this out loud and then do it was probably one of my top five pride moments of the year. And that's the point. When you remove that fear of failure, teachers pick up the mantle. We have government teachers that did a whole new grading practice this year that they share at BLT. So I'm proud of the fact that at the high school, administrators don't lead much. We support every, we support them. Um, and, and, and I think the buy-in, and Heather, I, I see you shaking your heads. So I think you're agreeing with me. The buy-in this year has exponentially gone up. Something which I, I just am very, very proud of because it makes me feel good. I'm not leading the leadership team. I'm just facilitating the teachers who are leading the leadership teams. And I think that's that's another you know key action step is that we as leaders, you know, are, are so used to well, I need to tell the teachers I need you to do this or I need you to do that. Where it's it's about kind of taking that back seat and just being there as a support. And, you know, one thing that I, I failed to mention with this district leadership team is that every single teacher member had a, had a co had a consultant that, you know, met with them, came to observe a lesson, met with them again. How is it going? And and I don't know that we provided as consultants so much insights, but it was just causing them to reflect more and asking more questions about their lessons, about what they're thinking, what do they want to do next? And I think, you know, with the, the craziness and the pace of the day, I, I think that's something that teachers don't get enough of. It's time to really sit back and have to reflect, well, why did I do it this way? Or what else do I need to do? And I think, like they said, this DLT time provided them time to kind of really think and reflect and, and think about the changes that we, we want to make. So again, just big picture action step. We need to provide that space, that time for teachers to really think and kind of, you know, slow down a little bit to go faster, I think is going to be key in this work um, and, and, and taking it forward. And then, you know, finally, what I am excited about is that every DLT member, I think we had 20 or so teachers on the team. Everybody wants to continue into year two. So, you know, to take this even deeper and to think about how we'll measure and, you know, creating a cornerstone or a capstone project at the end of the year and, and, and start to develop those with this team is going to be phenomenal. And they even want to think about another cohort one and bringing some more teachers together. You know, we're going to scale it district wide next year, but also maybe giving them a little extra attention to kind of help them through a process. So it's it's taken off and that's exciting. Um, it, it takes time and it's it's a it's more work, but it's great work and it's the work we need to be doing. Thank you so much. I have learned so much from Strongsville over the years, but also um, in this conversation today, you inspire me, you inspire so many people. Um, that's why I'm so excited that you were willing to tell your story because now we can share it with a broader audience. So thank you for all that you're doing. Jenny, do you have any closing words for either your team or for the, for our listeners? Anything you want us to consider? Well, I know, um, our integration specialist couldn't be with us today and she's an integral part of this um, and, and her work and her partnership with me has been phenomenal, but I'll, I'll share a story. So, you know, we were trying to, at the start of the year, we're trying to think about how to do this and how to invite people to do extra work that when they're already bogged down with everything else that we had on the plate for this, the start of this year. And so I think we said, well, why don't we get balloons? You know, balloons always make people happy. So I, I did write a letter inviting them to this great adventure and um, delivered the balloon um, to the class and, and, and the letter to them. And uh, so I, I laughed to say that it all started with a green balloon. Um, but I just can't thank 
all of our DLT members, our, our team, our SOAR team for, for taking a chance on this and having everybody be a part of it and the efforts that they put forth on top of everything else to not only do this in their classroom, but provide the feedback necessary so that we can be successful scaling this long-term. Awesome. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, team. You are amazing and we appreciate that you told your story. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sarah.